Okay, so 31 year female uh, who had uh, regular ultrasound of the abdomen and uh, they found all the organs except the left kidney. So here we could see the spleen and the left kidney were not visualized in this area. So again, we have this another image of the spleen with no kidney. And here we have the spleen again, no kidney. So they got an MRI for this. And also in, there was an incidental liver lesion, which is not significant for this case. So I'm not gonna show that. But anyways, uh, the main finding is for the kidney and uh, in the MRI. So these are the coronal situated images and uh, do we see kidney or is there anything wrong with it or those are normal kidneys maybe i could show the axial images so this is the heart you can see kidneys liver spleen a gallstone some sludge They look really high up and the spleen is also quite long. Yeah. Yeah, that's the positive finding. Do, do you know what it is? I've never seen this case myself. And uh, I knew I knew it that there is some entity called intrathoracic kidney. Uh, these are definitely not within the thorax. They are still within the abdomen. But on the coronal, as we can see, they are almost touching the diaphragm. Uh, in these images where we can see they are reaching up to the diaphragm they're above the liver on the right side and definitely above the spleen on the left side so it's again type of the ectopic uh, kidneys it is cephalid uh, ectopic kidneys or subdiaphragmatic yeah subdiaphragmatic and uh, these are usually associated with uh, as where you can see the enlarged or elongated spleen. Even in the liver, we can see they are very, uh, the lower margin is very low, not only on the for the right lobe, but also for the left hepatic lobes. And if we look at the heart, it is, uh, the apex is not pointing towards the left side. It's somewhat in the midline, uh, as we can also see in this image. So the ventricle or the apex is somewhere in the midline. So probably mesocardia as well. Yeah, so this was an interesting case. Wow, um, I've never seen that. I have two questions. Where are the adrenal glands there? Yeah, adrenal, it was a little bit difficult to see, but I... Oh yeah, I think, I think they're up there. Yeah, adrenal are in somewhat normal location. Mm. And when there is like inadequate ascent, then we see those pancake kidney or when there is renal agenesis, but probably the adrenal was well shaped by the uh, renal ascent. I think it's because it's over suiting of ascent of the kidneys. Uh, yeah, so never seen this thing before. So I thought I would. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I presume that they might have like more hydronephrosis, but it's probably super rare if since not, at least I've never seen it or heard of it. So that's really cool. Yeah, so I just have one slide for this one. So it's called subdiaphragmatic cephalid renal ectopia. And uh, normally there is cephalid migration in second month of gestation. And the exact cause is not known, but they say uh, it could be because of malpositioned liver as in seen in case of omphalocele. I didn't see many case reports of similar, uh, you know, like over ascent or the cephalid renal ectopia much, uh, but there is a case report where in five-year kid, there is an, uh, the similar subdiaphragmatic renal ectopia uh, when the patient has omphalocele. Uh, so that makes sense when there's omphalocele, liver is pushed anteriorly. So there is a space for the kidneys to ascend higher than normal. But in our case, there is this, this is purely incidental finding. And also they say some issue with the adrenal and also some say delayed in growth of ureter in the metanephros leading to diminished stimulus, stimulus to metanephros. So, for example, as we know from embryology, so this is the metanephros and this is the ureteric bird and uh, ureteric bird leads to stimulation of the metanephros to become the uh, 
uh, differentiated from the kidneys. So one hypothesis is if there is inadequate stimulation by the ureteric bird into the mitonephric tissue, then the ascent process might be longer than, or you know, like it can continue for longer duration uh, compared to normal. And it's associated with duplex collecting system. And since this kidney and everything, uh, uh, these entities develop from mesoderm, so it is associated with mesoderm anomalies, probably cardiovascular, genital urinary, and skeletal system. Our case, probably mesocardia might be one of the association. Yeah, that's the case. Sorry. Um, so the other cases are quick ones. So this is uh, uh, female, I think, in her 60s. But yeah, only the incidental findings. So we have a few cysts, uh, liver cysts. But this thing, we certainly see this dilated contrast field outpouching. I'm uh, not sure if it is very common. I have not seen this before, so I thought maybe I should. Uh... Is it ectasia of the portal vein? Yes, yes, Doug. So this is just portal vein varix. Mm -hmm. so, I've seen yeah. one case before, but that mm -hmm. was an ultrasound. Oh. So as we can see it here, there is eccentric outpouching of the main portal vein immediately adjacent to the uh, splenomesenteric confluence. It measures roughly around like 34 millimeter or so. And the interesting uh, finding about this case was it was so huge that it caused some compressive symptoms. And here we can see the IBC is compressed. And uh, even it could be, you know, like related artifact, but this patient had some workup done in the outside hospital. We don't have those images, but they say patient had IBC thrombosis because of this compression. So I'm not sure if these are, uh, you know, like remnants of the IBC thrombosis due to mechanical compression by this uh, portal venous barracks. Yeah, I've seen a couple of cases of big varices. Do you know what they did with this one? Ours, they've just been watching, like they don't, stent or thromb um you know put any coils or anything like that but no i don't think they did anything in our case as well the only thing patient was getting treated was for this ibc thrombosis so our case uh, didn't have any liver uh, lesions except the incidental liver cyst there was no cirrhosis or you know, portal hypertension uh, so but the common etiology is cirrhosis of liver portal hypertension trauma pancreatitis and they say the extra hepatic location is more common likely, for example, in our case, and it's most common at the splenomesenteric confluence, like in our case, the shape, it says fusiform is more common than sacular. I don't know if what we have to say in our case, it looks like a bit sacular on the uh, sagittal images. What do you think? Doesn't make any difference, I suppose, whether it is sacular or fusiform, right? Yeah, that looks secular to me because it's extending beyond, but it's, I agree that it probably doesn't make a difference, mm -hmm. especially if they're not treating it. Just the semantics, yeah, but nothing. Yeah, yeah, those are the two cases from me, Doug. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure, Doug. Uh, does anyone else have cases? Okay. So um, this was a patient who had. Um, biliary obstruction, they went for an ERCP, and um, they ended up having a stricture with a lot of pus um, and cholangitis. Um, so they had a lot of pus and debris in their common bile duct. So they placed a stent, and this was their post-op scan. Um, the patient also had a history of chronic pancreatitis. So you can see that the duct is dilated, the gland is atrophic, and um, there's fibrosis in the head, and that was part of what was causing um, the biliary obstruction. Um, but then post-op or post-ERCP, this is what the uh, surrounding area looked like. So what do you guys think about these collections? Some abscesses. Okay, that's a thought. So are you thinking that also because of the air in there? Yes. Yeah, so air can be, it can be from a gas forming infection. 
It can also be iatrogenic. So they just did this ERCP. And so maybe they there was some kind of rupture or leak um, causing that air over there. Um, and then the third thing air can be from is a fistula with bowel, which we didn't see. Um, we thought this was less likely to be an abscess just because the wall was thin. Mm -hmm. And then this one back here also we thought was probably a biloma mm -hmm. and the wall looked thin and there wasn't a lot of surrounding inflammatory change. Could these be uh, like uh, pancreatic, uh, peripancreatic uh, collections? We can't call them pseudocysts yet, but. Could this yeah, continue? good. That's a great thought. So we know we just did an ERCP. The patient has chronic pancreatitis. Maybe they induced some acute pancreatitis and caused pancreatic uh, juice leak. And so maybe this was an acute fluid collection. And they like to kind of um, insinuate into and onto the, into other organs, like into the wall of the stomach, into the liver, into the spleen. Um, this one actually did look like it was kind of um, eroding into the caudate. Um, some, there was a debate, like, is this arising from the caudate? Like, is this an intrahepatic collection caused by the cholangitis and then biliary, like cholangitis causing a, a, a biloma, like intrahepatic biloma? I did not think it was in the caudate lobe itself. I thought it was adjacent to it and maybe kind of eroding into it. Um, so what do you guys think we should do next? The patient was acting septic. They wanted to know what these were. We can drain the posterior one, I suppose. Okay. So we could drain the posterior one. We decided not to do that yet. We had raised the possibility of a bile leak, especially oh, because okay. of this air within the collection and thought maybe um, some, some bile, maybe we, we thought it could be connected over to the CBD through here and that it was like dissecting over into this area. So because we thought about a bile leak, we recommended an EAVIS scan. By the time they did the MRI, the fluid collections were, um, this one was a little bit larger. This one was about the same. And then we did our EAVIS and this was our 20 minute EAVIS. And there was some like peripheral kind of enhancement to this collection, but we didn't really see any intraluminal extravasation. Um, and just to cut to the chase, we monitored the scan and because we had a high suspicion, we actually ended up going to 120 minutes. And even by 90 minutes, we didn't see um, any extravasation into the collection. But here at 120 minutes, you can see that there's EAVIS in the biliary system. There's actually also filling defects within the common bile duct. And when we look at our collection, there is actually active extravasation of EAVIS into the collection. And if you see here, it's actually coming from this caudate duct that is injured kind of like at the surface of the liver, the caudate duct is injured here and is extravasating into the, this biloma. So this was a little bit unusual. It was not a bile leak from the actual um, CBD. And so we don't know if this caudate duct just started leaking because, um, because it was so dilated, it kind of just started leaking at the liver surface or if during the ERCP, they somehow damaged or you know, um, kind of compressed the caudate lobe and caused um, damage at the surface, but the caudate duct here seemed to be leaking at the surface into this biloma. And the second biloma over here did not have any contrast extravasating into it. So what they ended up doing was actually putting a drain into this biloma, because since this was an active bile leak, um, the way you treat that is by putting in a CBD stent and also putting a drain into the biloma so you can dry it up and hope that the active biliary leak um, uh, cools off. So I have a question, couple of questions for the group. Um, one, when do you stop your EAVIS scans for when you're suspicious of a bile leak? We've been having some discussion in our group about should you stop at one hour, two hours, keep going? When do you guys stop? Anyone? Arti, we have gone up to four hours max and we've picked up by leaks on the delayed. So those are helpful, but I'm not sure going beyond four hours is really helpful or not. Okay. And when a lot of times you get this hepatic dysfunction, I think in this one too, like you didn't see your excretion at 20 minutes where we see it in normal livers. So 
we have to keep that in mind that patients who have abnormal LFTs are going to show delayed excretion. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. So our case actually, um, a lot of, most of the bile ducts did not um, enhance. Some of them did, but these very dilated ones didn't enhance until much later. Um, so that's one of the things, if your bilirubin is elevated um, above three or four, you should be careful because um, the IVIS might not work. Um, we've been stopping it around two hours. So this 120 minutes, um, just also for practicality, like, you know, we, did, we didn't know how long to keep them down in the MRI suite. Um, but I haven't seen any that we saw past two hours. Like, Githanjali, the ones that you saw at four hours, were you not able to see them before that? Like at three hours, for example? It's more for uh, like the patient, they come down, they're um, in patients, and then we send them up back to their rooms and not wait, let them wait where mm. the scanner is. And like by the time we call them back, it's already four hours past. That's the only reason. And there's no other logic behind it. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, basically send them back to their room and then call them back down. So, um, so anyway, this was an active bile leak in a patient post ERCP. So if you see that kind of air in there, think this could be iatrogenic, um, this could be a bile leak, you could get an EAVIS scan. If the EAVIS is not excreting well or you have a high suspicion for a bile leak, consider um, sending them back up or putting another patient on the scanner and, and doing a delayed scan. Okay, um, this is... Mm -hmm. A question. So uh, if you have option for HIDA versus EAVIS MRI to detect bile leak, what do you recommend? Um, I prefer EAVIST MRI because you can see which bile, uh, which bile duct is leaking. For mm -hmm. example, like here, because they did ERCP, we were more suspicious that the common bile duct was injured, um, but we're kind of reassured knowing that this is just the surface of the caudate. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like a less severe injury than a common bile duct injury. So for me, it's more helpful to see exactly which bile duct is leaking. Um, but I think, you know, if you have a if you ask a nuclear medicine person, they probably would recommend a HIDA. I know that HIDA can work better if you're even when the bilirubin is more elevated. So if mm -hmm. bilirubin is five or 10 and you're not going to do an EAVIS scan, um, HIDA can work well there. And what do we do with the other bilirubin? Just leave it alone? It will go. Yeah, away. this one we decided was probably like um, leakage from this one over here and then it walled itself off. And so we're just leaving this one alone for now. But you could have, we could have easily stuck a drain in this one as well. Um, generally, we don't tend to stick drains in bilomas or hematomas unless we know that they're active, actively connected to something like actively leaking. Um, mm -hmm. It should resorb on its own. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if, if you're worried that it's infected, you can also always stick a drain into it. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is my next case. Um, so here is a... 50 year old patient had this large mass next to the liver or arising from the liver. You can see that it has like evil gray with central necrosis here. And I'll show you a couple of other sequences. So this is my arterial phase. You can see there's some areas with avid peripheral enhancement. This is the delayed phase where I think there's some washout. And then I'll show you the coronal. This is the coronal. So what do you guys think? Okay, good thought. So when you have a mass in this area, well, you could think it's coming from the liver. So that could be a fibrolamellar HCC with that huge kind of scar. Anything else? Maybe giant hemangioma. Okay, yeah. definitely not a hemangioma. So um, this kind of gray, you would not see in a hemangioma. It should be nice and bright mm -hmm. and it should have globular enhancement um, that has more centripetal enhancement. But the clue that this is not a hemangioma is the T2 here. This is too much kind of evil gray to be a hemangioma. What oh, what's the age of the something? patient, I think? 50 year old female? Okay. Something from the adrenal, like adrenal malignancy. Yeah, great. So don't forget about the adrenal gland. So even though this looks like it's coming from the liver, um, in this little area here, this could definitely be from the adrenal gland, like an adrenal cortical carcinoma. And that was actually our number one guess. 
Um, the one confusing thing here was that also it looked almost like there was like a claw sign with the kidney. So could this be a large renal mass? And I guess this is the failure of the claw sign because in the end, this turned out to be an adrenal mass. So um, even if you see this kind of claw or pseudo claw, um, it's not necessarily from, from that organ. So this was an adrenal mass and we still thought this was gonna be an adrenal cortical carcinoma. And this actually turned out to be a picoma. So does anyone know anything about picomas? I always have to re-look it up every time I get a picoma, but any, anyone remember anything about it? The sugar tumors, and then there's some association with other genetic disorders. Yeah, yeah, so picomas are parenchymal tumors and they're called, um, perivascular epithelial, um, I forgot what PEC stands for, but anyway, um, they're basically these mesenchymal tumors and two examples of picomas are AMLs and LAM, both of which are seen in tuberous sclerosis. So picoma is a larger term for the family and AMLs and LAMs are within the picoma family. This turned out to be a malignant picoma so it was, um, it was just, it was not an AML, it was not a lamb, it was a malignant epithelioid tumor and they resected it and it's actually already recurred. So um, they, they have varying malignant potential um, and they can, they can be malignant and especially if they're larger and more aggressive looking like this, um, they can recur. I don't think there's any way we could have called this a picoma ahead of time. I think it's just something to be aware of and then to kind of look around for other picomas because um, these can be affiliated with um, AMLs and LAM. And, um, and then also, you know, I think just on, at baseline, we should have suspected maybe this was like always bring up adrenal tumors. Um, we've been tricked before where we bring up like HCC and then this turns out to be an adrenal tumor. So if it's in this corner here, it's a huge mass, always think about adrenal cortical carcinoma. Okay, this is my next case. Uh, this liver lesion is fairly T2 bright, well circumscribed. Ignore the gallbladder for now. On the arterial phase, it looked like this. And on the more delayed phase, it looked like this. This patient was actually presenting with cholecystitis. This is what it looked like on the delayed phase. So we thought that there was some enhancement in it. So what do you guys think? This patient did not have a history of liver disease. You can actually see they've got a nice rim sign um, of inflammation in their liver adjacent to their cholecystitis. But what do you guys think about this lesion here? Any, any thoughts? What should we put in the differential? Bring back the T2. Some form of a mangiuma. It's too T2 bright. <laughs> Good. I didn't trick you. So this actually was biopsied and it came back. Um, basically, it was, they said, a vascular tumor, which includes sclerosing hemangioma and other types of um, vascular tumors. So I, I believe that this is a sclerosing hemangioma. The other thing we brought up in the differential because sclerosing hemangioma is a diagnosis of exclusion was a cholangiocarcinoma. Um, they're usually not this bright like this. That was a good clue. Um, it even had this remnant cystic, like much brighter area. Um, it had this kind of globular little delayed enhancement, not classic at all, but that's why it's sclerosing, which means that it's laying down fibrosis. Um, and you basically can give the differential and um, they can biopsy it and make sure that it's not a MET or a cholangiocarcinoma because those are the three main things. When you see um, an indeterminate mass that has some delayed enhancement would be MET, um, cholangio, especially if there's background liver disease, which we didn't see here, and uh, sclerosing hemangioma, which this was. Okay, uh, this is just a nice catch. So this was a non-contrast exam for um, hematuria. It was a stone protocol. Just go through the kidneys and let me know if you see anything. Yeah, right, pelvic mass. 
Right, yeah, the, good. Yeah. So even if it's a non-con, just look here, for example, you can see that we're losing those normal fat planes and there's kind of expansion of the calyces and obliteration of the fat here. So we thought this looked too mass-like, this was suspicious. Um, they ended up getting a MRI and you can see that there is this intermediate T2 signal mass here. And it um, demonstrated kind of low level enhancement. And this was a um, fairly large urethelial cancer um, that you can, you can pick up on the non-con if you, if you look for those contradeformities, loss of fat planes. Okay, I have one more. Okay, so this is a 47 year old female. I'll show you the sagittal as well. Urethral adenocarcinoma. Yeah, that's what I, I thought this was going to be. You can see that there's actually a couple of lesions. Oh. There's one here, and then there's this large one here that is centered, you know, kind of at the dome of the, um, at the bladder. When it's, especially when it's centered anteriorly we, and bulky like this, we think about urachal tumors. So we brought up a urachal tumor. Um, this, this actually, um, I'll show you a couple of other sequences. You can see that kind of lobulated, moderate enhancement. And then I'll show you, they actually ended up doing a percutaneous biopsy, if you guys can see this. So they, under ultrasound guidance, put a core biopsy needle into this and took core biopsies. And this turned out to be a urethelial carcinoma with squamous differentiation. So not something that we'd be able to tell, but um, you can see that it's super large. It's actually very aggressive, um, which squamous differentiation, urethelial cancers are more aggressive. Um, they have a high rate of recurrence and they especially recur within the first two years. Um, and the reason they actually did this um, percutaneous biopsy in this case was the patient had a few other interesting findings. They actually had a kind of um, abnormally formed unicornuate rudimentary horn here for their uterus and they had like an ectopic kidney. So there was some thought that this might be something unusual, not just a typical urothelial cancer, uh, maybe affiliated with the urachus. And so um, we ended up doing it as a percutaneous biopsy here. But it turned out to be a urothelial cancer with squamous differentiation. Hey, Arti, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, what is the chance of seeding if you do a biopsy this way rather than just do it yeah, I had that exact question for um, for my IR colleagues. Um, but actually, you know, we're doing these with coaxial needle. So in general, like we biopsy, for example, sarcomas, which were thought to have a high rate of seeding. And with coaxial needles, they actually have a basically negligible rate of seeding. So based on that experience, um, we they thought this would be um, safe. So well, the reason is because, I mean, cystoscopy, you could get it so easily. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I think in retrospect, um, we could have done it cystoscopically, but I also think that this is, you know, it was okay. Um, it was interesting. We always, you know, for urothelial cancer, we always want to get the muscle to see if it's muscle invasive. I mean, in this case, it's kind of no question. It looks almost like, it, you know, it's going beyond the wall here. So, um, and there was like suspicious lymph nodes as well. Um, but in general, when we do these cystoscopic biopsies, we want to make sure we get the muscle. If it is muscle invasive, that's when they do a total cystectomy rather than just going for a transurethral um, resection of bladder tumor. So um, in this case, they did get muscle because they were going from the outside and they saw that it was muscle invasive. Um, but uh, yeah, you could have easily done it. That's the one limitation cystoscopically. Like, would you be, have been able to get all the way to you know, the deeper levels? Um, to, to kind of say that it's definitely muscle invasive. That's where actually MRI could be good for staging, uh, where we can clearly tell them that like, it looks like it's going beyond the bladder wall. Does anyone, uh, there's this Virads now, oh no, wait, Virads. It's like um, bladder cancer staging using MRI. I know they're doing it at UT Southwestern. Um, so some people do a whole bladder protocol. They will make sure that the patient has um, enough fluid in their bladder, do high resolution images through the bladder and try to do the T staging on MRI as well.
Okay, that's all my cases. Anyone else have cases? Anyone? Okay, Amr, Minu, Gitanjali, I'm waiting for you guys to bring your cases next time. And um, thank you, Swachanda, for presenting. And uh, Mina, were you going to say something? I just uh, nothing actually. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't going to promise me a case next time. <laughs> yeah, I was going to. I was going to, but then okay, I thought uh, I'll uh, undercome it and then over prayer, over uh, you know, present. So that's okay, a better perfect. way of doing it. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll have a great day, everyone. See you later. Thank you. Yep, thanks. Bye.